I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Yes and Russell Brand, where I say a resounding yes to Russell's conspiracy to take down the empire using meditation and meaningful conversations with interesting people. This one is going to be addressing Prepare for the Apocalypse with Bradley Garrett. The take that I'm going to use for this, I call Bunkers versus Bankers. And the question I'll be asking is, why is it easier for 1% of us to take seriously and put time, effort, and money into preparing for an annihilation apocalypse rather than believing that 7 billion plus of us are enough to mildly inconvenience a handful of bankers, not the 1%, but one in a million, 0.000001% in order to make the world that we want possible for all of us. In order to do this, I'm going to be using my visual prop, Kali, who is the goddess of creation and destruction, the uh, of time and of power, considered by some the ultimate reality. She's often pictured dancing on the body of her consort, Shiva, who submits to her dominatrix activity because he welcomes chaos. And she's in her four hands holding the severed head of, uh, of someone that she's cut it off with, with the uh, sword in the other. So we'll put her away for now. I'd like to start by talking about the meaning of the word apocalypse. Apocalypse from the Greek is apo uncovering calypso chaos. So it's something that strips away the illusion, the uh, confusion that disguises what the underlying reality is. Another very interesting word is crisis, also from the Greek. And that is something that means both opportunity and emergency. I'd like to read from my book, How to Dismantle an Empire, in a chapter called Grease Lightning, where I analyzed the conditions that led up to the revolution that culminated in Yanis Varoufakis and his economic plan. This is Revolt and Crisis in Greece by Christos Linteros. Crisis comprises the opportunity, kairos, par excellence of truth, the time when all phenomena and illusions give way before a momentary and fully recognizable explosion of the true substance of the human condition. Quoting Foucault, truth is not lying there waiting to be grasped by us. It passes and it passes rapidly like lightning. It is in any case linked to the opportunity, to the kairos, and must be seized. Linteros talks about all the things that led up to the Greek Uh, crisis. And there were austerity measures, there were all kinds of really big things that were going on. But the spark that led to the revolution was the murder of a 15-year-old schoolboy by a policeman. That single event just was the lightning strike that ended up illuminating the crisis for everyone. And so people started meeting in the neighborhoods. They started forming plans. They started saying, okay, we need to, we need to do something now. In our lives, we don't know what that crisis is going to be, but it may not be an apocalypse that, or an annihilation that we need to prepare for. It may be something that we should be looking at other plans that we put into place that may save all of us. So let's look at the bunker scenario. What that is, is Bradley calls it a thought experiment, but it's a very fear-based thought experiment. It's something that says, okay, if all of humanity is wiped out practically, How am I going to survive? And that leads to the Noah's Ark dilemma of who do you let in? Do you let in your neighbors, your loved ones, um, 
children? How many people are you going to aim at with that AK-47 out of the gun turret? And I think that there's a logical outcome to that that we need to face, which is that if you're going to be the last person with a lifeboat on the Titanic, you're going to need to be prying finger by finger people who are trying to cling on and you're going to have to send them out into the into the ocean, you know, feed them to the sharks. I don't know whether that's an apocalypse that I would even want to survive. Even when Russell talks about his guilt-based scenario of should I bring in a, a family of refugees so that I feel like I'm, I'm doing something? How does that actually work? How do you choose who you're going to save? Do you hold a lottery? Do you hold auditions? Somewhere you have to decide these six people are going to be the ones I save and the rest of you are just going to have to fend for yourself, which again, sounds to me like you have to get into that place of judgment that I try to get away from in my life. So I'd like to introduce another thought experiment. And for this, I'm, I'm going to use my friend Kali. So a thought experiment, I'm not asking you to believe anything. What I'm asking you to do is suspend your dogma for the moment to essentially rearrange the furniture in your, in your head and try out the sofa in the left cortex and see what the view looks like from there. Don't judge it, just try it on. You can always move it back. So Kali, we agree, I think, that she is objective reality this pillow because I see her and you see her and because we're separate minds and we both agree that this pillow exists, this pillow is objective reality. If one of us saw Kali and the other didn't, then we would say that's subjective reality that exists in one person's head and therefore is, is a delusion. So objective reality is based on the premise that we are all separate minds and whatever our separate senses and minds perceive is outside of our bodies. It is objective. However, all of the mystics of every religious tradition have come to the con same conclusion, which is that we are one mind. We're really not separate minds inside separate bodies but we are one mind that perhaps contains all of these figments of separate bodies. So if there's not an objective reality, this entire world could be our dream. We could be the dreamer and this could be our dream. If this is our dream, why? Why have we dreamt up this particular dream that what I look at is why do we believe that we're so powerless in this dream? Why do we think that we can't change anything? Is there an attraction to that powerlessness? Do we want to see ourselves as weak? So under that hypothetical, which should be considered because we can neither prove nor disprove it. It meets all of the data points. And so it just should be considered as one hypothesis. Under that scenario, if we are, say, an eternal being, but we have put ourselves into this dream, into this coma, is this dream our death wish? Is it something that we've come up with as a way of an eternal being committing suicide. So if that were true, then every time there is an annihilation scenario uh, that we, or that we say climate change, the, um, the doomsday clock, it's only a second for midnight now, rather than that being a motivation for us to change, 
it may be something that secretly makes us think, great. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, Giant Meteor 2020, just get it over with. That may be the scenario that is pulling us, that has an attraction for us. And that what we don't want to look at is that we are the God of this dream. And that the face of that God is the face of destruction. It's the face of death. So if, if this were our dream, we could change it. We could change it as easily as changing our mind. Instead of preparing for an annihilation where we survive out of exclusion, maybe Russell's revolution in which we are inclusive, in which we convince people of their deep worthiness, their how much they deserve the kind of society that we're trying to create, how, how much they deserve to be loved. Maybe that's the kind of revolution that could succeed. If you're intrigued and would like to go deeper into these ideas, here's another video on a related theme. And if you'd like to delve into this entire area, here's a playlist. Thank you, and I would love it if you would subscribe.